All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, everybody had their coffee? I hope not yet. Okay, get some, get some soon. Um, my name is Joachim, and uh, I'm not a Java developer, so I'll get that out here in the first place. Uh, so what do I do? I work for a company called Smalls, and Smalls is one of the oldest IT companies in Belgium, and nobody knows that it exists, though it's one of the largest as well. We employ 2,000 people. Uh, that we work exclusively for governments. We uh, do most of the back end of the Belgian social security systems and uh, other government services as well. So we only work for public services, government institutions, and um, on all levels. And we build or uh, give them services. We build software and uh, do all their IT management sometimes, or sometimes just provide support. Good. Um, Smalls is a large company and it also has a small research team. And in this research team, of which I am part, we investigate new technologies, upcoming technologies, and we try to see if it can be of any use in a government context. So, uh, of course, artificial intelligence is one of the major topics that we deal with, but uh, we have also colleagues of mine that are uh, interested and investigate applications of blockchain, uh, new kinds of databases, what can you do with web scraping, uh, all sorts of uh, cryptography solutions, uh, authentication and whatnot. So uh, what's the interest of the government and government services in artificial intelligence? Well, obviously, we're not going to build self-driving cars. Uh, but uh, several uh, artificial intelligence-related technologies uh, could be of use to uh, improve the efficiency of government or improve the uh, automation of the administration. Chatbots are becoming very popular because if you've ever tried to contact your city administration at 10 p.m., you know they don't pick up the phone. So they're really a good use case for that. Uh, fraud detection, decision support, uh, automatic translation, especially in a country like Belgium, is important. Everything that has to do with uh, smart cities, smart everything, um, gets more and more attention. In general, trying to optimize services that the government offers to the general public. So, uh, Government services are also managed by managers, and government managers are no different than other managers. They uh, are often have degrees in law or in politics. They uh, rarely have written a single line of code in their lives. So yeah, we need to explain to those people what can we do with artificial intelligence. Because if they go look on the internet, they see Elon Musk talk uh, crazy things, they see uh, fantastic presentations by Google, by Facebook on their yearly conferences, or they read books like The Singularity is Near, and they start dreaming about uh, the robots taking over and whatnot. And being managers, they have an enormous fear of missing out. So uh, that's where people like me come into play. Like We need to put them with, those, with two feet on the ground and make sure that they have a realistic view of what this technology can do. So then we go to them, we present to them, like, look, have you thought about privacy, GDPR issues? You're working with data that is uh, sometimes sensitive, that is owned by the general public, and that you can't do just anything with, especially given the GDPR. Have you considered that the data that you might be using is biased, bias that can be inherit inherited by uh, AI systems? Have you considered problems of precision, recall, accuracy in any AI system that you want to implement? What do you do if the prediction is wrong? Very often, if you go bring AI in practice, well, it looks good on paper, it looks good, the, the promise looks good, but in practice, those AI systems uh, rarely meet the targets that uh, the managers have in mind. So that's uh, where I often uh, come into play. And people don't like to see me come and uh, like uh, destroy their dreams. But it's very necessary to make a good estimate of what all this stuff is going to cost to be a bit realistic about everything. 
So I'm a bit preaching to the choir, I'm afraid, because most of you are developers. Most of you will have a good idea of what uh, AI is. I do want to talk about a lot of things, and mostly about things that can go wrong with AI, because I believe there's more than enough gurus that have TED Talks and videos on YouTube already that will sell you the dreams. There's plenty of those. You don't need them. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of what I tell sometimes to these managers in government, uh, just to make them sure to make sure that they've uh, considered all the possible downsides as well. So I'm going to divide this into uh, three or four parts, depending on how much time that I uh, have. Maybe I'll skip a few slides here and there, and uh, let's. Uh, uh, organize it as follows. First of all, if you build your AI, what can go wrong? What can you do wrong uh, when building an AI? This is maybe the most interesting part for you. But also, once your AI is live, well, other people get to use it. What, can, what could they do? What could an attacker do to try and subvert the AI system? These AI systems are live and they also have an implication on society. So, uh, Someone's AI, we're all subject to AIs, uh, we all use recommendation systems, we all uh, go apply for a loan uh, at a bank uh, and they're going to analyze our data and whatnot. So what happens if that kind of stuff goes wrong? What if an AI uh, has an impact on your own life? And that's a subject of a very important uh, public debate that really needs to be uh, uh, done, actively done. And if there's some time, I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, policy issues and what can be done to defend uh, against uh, some of the major risks. So let's start. We're going to build our own AI system. And our AI system is trained on data. We need to teach it something and we give it a load of examples. So uh, there's this old saying, I don't know where it comes from, garbage in, garbage out, but it's very, very, very true. So. Ideally, you want your training data to be uh, somehow well-balanced. You want your training data to be free of any hidden correlations. Uh, in technical terms, you want it to be independent and in identically distributed over the domain, the domain being the set of uh, input var variables or um, uh, input features of your uh, AI system. But in reality, if you do any case out of, the, out of a lab setting, well, this is very rarely the case. Data is going to be biased in some way. You're going to have uh, more or less data. There's going to be something, uh, some correlations in there that you haven't thought about. And this uh, is a major problem because this limits the generali generalizability potential of your AI system. Uh, data can be biased. Data can be... Uh, unbalanced or balanced towards a certain category um, in your data sets. And data is collected by humans as well, and humans also have a bias. If you've never read this Wikipedia article, the list of cognitive biases, I really, really recommend you take a look. It uh, lists over 200 potential biases that we as humans are uh, subjective to, uh, are subjects to. Uh, for example, we all like to hear what confirms our belief. Confirmation bias is a very typical one. Uh, but there are plenty more, and they subconsciously uh, decide what we do. They uh, have an impact on how um, we focus our attention and thereby have an impact on how we collect the data. And this is often a very subcon sub subconscious uh, mechanism. Of we're, we're not aware of it, but this seeps through. And if your data set in some way is biased, this gets inherited by your uh, AI system, which gets trained on that biased data, and your result, the result is a biased AI system. This can lead to uh, major fuck-ups and headlines that you don't want to uh, have in the newspaper as a company. Uh, the typical example is facial recognition in the early days, uh, certainly. Facial recognition systems were built by uh, white male engineers, so they were really good at recognizing white male faces, because those engineers built the data sets, and they had problems with people of color and sometimes also maybe with women major problem, though this problem gets repeated time and time and again. So this was a headline from 2009, here's one from uh, 2016, exact same problem, here's one from 2017, exact same problem. This 
doesn't only happen with uh, facial recognition, this can happen in any AI system. And uh, Amazon had a very uh, high profile case where they tried to build an AI system to uh, analyze incoming CVs. Amazon, a company like Amazon, gets tens of thousands of CVs. It's uh, an insane amount of uh, information. And most of those CVs are not interesting at all. So they tried to build an automated tool to sift through those CVs and only select those that had some potential of being of interest to the company. Problem being, of course, Amazon being an IT company, uh, unfortunately, uh, historically, and up until now, uh, it's, uh, it's very... Male, it's a very male company. So their data set was very male focused to begin with. They trained it on CVs of people they had actually hired. And those people were predominantly male. So in the end, they built a system that uh, disproportionately disadvantaged women. And of course, uh, this got discovered, this got out, Amazon scrapped it. To be uh, fair, they, of course, they didn't put this in production, but this was really, really bad rep. Now, they're not stupid at Amazon. They're really smart guys there. So, uh, of course, if you build an AI system like that and it sifts through all the information in a CV, you try and uh, filter out all the protected characteristics to try and make sure that the AI cannot take it into account. You're going to ignore all information that refers to gender, ignore all information that refers to racial background, and make sure that you only uh, keep the information that's as objective as possible and relates to people's skills and jobs. But that doesn't really solve the problem. It turns out that men and women have different ways of speaking. Uh, in general, they use language differently. So on the right side here, I've pasted an image, a very extreme example that comes from a study in 2013 done on social media. So this is teenager talk. This is just a very extreme illustration of this viewpoint. Uh, but I don't have to tell you, you can guess which cluster is uh, the teenage boys and which cluster are the teenage girls. Uh, it's obvious. Uh, this is social media, this is maybe an extreme example, but in CVs uh, the differences are not as uh, extreme, but they're still there. There are still minute differences between the use of language uh, between men and women in CVs. Uh, men and women, turns, as it turns out, they stress other things, they stress other skills, and they mention different things, they mention different kind of hobbies. So even if there's no information at all about gender uh, or uh, racial background, these things could be inferred from the information um, that was present in, for example, uh, their education background or the skills that they put in their CV. So in the end, it turns out that gender was still a, a prominent confounding factor in Amazon's model. model. They still had a bias in their AI system in the end. It didn't solve the problem. I do want to stress that they did not put this in production. They scrapped this thing. So, and this is a really good thing. Uh, for every biased AI system that exists, I can assure you there's 10 others that are not discovered and put into production, and those are the dangerous ones. So Amazon, to their credits, really, they took the only decision, they took the only right decision, decision that they could take. Uh, this really is in their favor, and uh, I do want to uh, stress this out. So we had a problem with uh, confounding factors here. So what's a confounding factor? A confounding factor is a hidden variable that influences both the properties, the features that you uh, are computing from your data set and the outcomes. Sometimes these confounding factors uh, can lead to surprising results. Suppose we want to build an AI system that can detect authorship. Uh, it's interesting in cases of plagiarism detection, for example. It turns out in some cases um, that it's uh, not even necessary to look at the words themselves. Uh, you might think that if you look at a text that's, well, what defines an author's style, well, the, the way he uses words, the way he uses language, maybe the vocabulary, uh, the verboseness and the complexity of the vocabulary. Uh, not at all. It's often enough to just look at the interpunction and, and you can really make out in a good way uh, what the difference authors are by just looking at something that has nothing to do with the vocabulary at all. So uh, that's one of these things that confounding problems can, uh, confounding variables uh, can result in. You might discover new things that might be very interesting. 
Good. Uh, the problem with these confounding factors is, well, your machine learning, your AI system gets drawn towards those factors at the expense of the desired features, at the expense of the features that you compute from your data set. And in the end, you've actually got a semantic gap between what you want the AI to learn, you want it to learn something, for example, about authorship style or vocabulary, and what the AI actually derives from the tra training data. The AI is only going to focus on uh, the, the simplest solution that works the best, which, is, which, which was in the previous case just interpunction. Um, so your AI systems don't necessarily learn what you think it's learning. It's really important to uh, have a look afterwards and see uh, is this doing what I'm expecting it to do? Is it actually focusing on the right things? This is not always easy, by the way. So how can you mitigate the problem of uh, confounding variables? Well, there's not really a, a, an all-encompassing solution. Uh, you could try and do a better sampling of the data, uh, do some randomization, stratification, try and get a more balanced data set. Uh, but mostly, like doing a good thorough statistical data analysis is the best way to discover some of those hidden features that might be there, like a multivariate analysis. We've spoken about bias. Not all bias is unfair. If you go to see, uh, if you work on a data set from a hospital uh, and you have a data set from the gynecology department, the obstetrics department, that data set is 100% uh, biased towards women. That is obvious. Uh, nobody's going to say that this is unfair or uh, that, that uh, you should also have a data set of uh, male patients of gynecologists. Uh, same uh, with other types of diseases. Some diseases are just tied to certain characteristics uh, and you have data sets that are biased. Not all bias is unfair. It's the unfair biases that are the problem. And when is a bias unfair? For example, when it's uh, based on a protected characteristic such as race or gender. Um, if uh, you uh, make a system that, for example, needs to make decisions uh, for uh, airport security or for um, uh, the, the, the courts or for, for your defense, for, for your, uh, to set your bail, to set your parole, uh, decisions that have to do with economy. Can you get a loan or not? Uh, you want those to be uh, fair. And it's in those applications that you really want to make sure that your system is uh, not biased at all. Now, uh, if you're very interested in these kind of topics of, uh, of bias and fairness, I can recommend you to uh, uh, read this uh, great book by Cathy O'Neill, The Weapons of Mass Destruction, that kind of uh, gives you an overview of everything that can go wrong uh, if uh, biased systems are put into the wild. Also, a very interesting profile uh, on Twitter to follow is um, uh, Rachel. Rachel forgot her last name. I'm terribly sorry. Um, works for Fast.ai um, and uh, tweets regularly about bias, fairness, and uh, those issues and ethics. Good. Know your data. That's the baseline here. What else can go wrong? Well, uh, machine learning systems, AI systems, they optimize an objective. Uh, and uh, in reinforcement learning, for example, you're going to say, well, you're going to want to reward success. You're, you want to punish failure. And the goal is to maximize the reward. And AI is going to try and maximize the reward. To be able to do that, you need to define what the goal actually is in, in some mathematical or sense or in some sense of code. But success is, is hard to define. Uh, and you want your definition to be as simple as possible. Uh, simple objective functions are easy to optimize and make the problem well defined and well constrained. Um, so you want your uh, definition of success to be simple. And unfortunately, those simplified objectives, they're often too approximative. They don't capture the entire uh, set of constraints that uh, you might want to have as well. But if you're going to add additional constraints that really, really complicates the optimization process, even might render the problem intractable or uh, uh, impossible to optimize uh, at all. So 
Yeah, this is a hard balance to strike. Uh, reinforcement learning systems are therefore notorious to be extremely hard to uh, get to succeed. They, they very often just uh, get stuck into endless loops. They're going to exploit bugs. They're going to um, exploit unexpected properties in the data. Um, and even if you get to do it very often, because you've simplified the objective in some sense, and uh, you can't encode all of the world's uh, constraints into your objective function, it's going to solve some sort of sur surrogate problem. If that surrogate problem uh, bears enough resemblance to the actual problem, OK, then it might work. But it can lead to uh, some unexpected behavior. So let's, for example, look at this robot uh, whose objective was to uh, jump as highly as possible. And uh, well, the problem here is you need to define what's jumping, what's jumping high. How are we going to define this? And uh, the programmer here uh, defined it as, uh, well, uh, the height of my robot is the highest point of any part of my robot uh, during uh, the process. So what does this robot do? It just uh, like grew a really, really, really large limb and toppled over, and then it reached the greatest height. This is not learning how to jump, uh, but it does fit the objective function that was defined by um, the programmer or the engineer. Um, good. Uh, that was it uh, about building your AI system. So suppose you've built your AI system, uh, you've uh, collected all the data, the data is unbiased, uh, you've got a nice objective function, everything works, and you deploy it into the wild. Uh, then you get to do deal with users. Users uh, always do things that you don't expect them to be doing, and users always, uh, well, don't always have uh, good faith. They can try and subvert your system. So um, security isn't really my main topic, but I'm going to highlight two possible attacks against AI systems that I think are important to uh, keep in mind. First of one. First of them is data poisoning. So data poisoning happens when uh, your attacker gets access to your training data set. And your attacker might inject false training data and compromise the learning process and in the end compromise the AI system. Uh, it might inject uh, data that's mislabeled, that's bogus, that's noisy. Um, and I think one of the most famous examples here is uh, the chatbot that Microsoft once put online called Tay. And Tay was a Twitter bot. And Microsoft thought like, OK, we need to train this bot as fast as possible. We're going to train it on the inputs that Twitter users tweet to it. Within 24 hours, this went wrong. That is, uh, 4chan got onto it, Reddit got onto it. People tweeted all sorts of racist uh, and uh, uh, things to it, and within 24 hours, that bot was the most racist and Nazist bot on the planet. Uh, really, Microsoft had to pull the plug uh, really, really fast. So what happened here, like, if you're gonna have uh, the general audience and the, the audience of Twitter or Reddit or 4chan decide what your training's data is gonna be, yeah, this is obviously inviting trouble. Um, Microsoft had lost control of their training data sets and uh, thereby let attackers in. So it's really important to keep control of the data that you are training on. So this was data poisoning. Another uh, famous example of uh, an attack vector against uh, AI systems, especially uh, systems of uh, image recognition, are the adversarial examples. So adversarial examples. Um, what happens here is you've got, your, you've got an image detection system, a classifier, and it turns out that making minute changes to the image might be enough to make the classifier think that something is something completely different. For example, I've got a temple here, uh, just changing a, a, the lighting a little bit, uh, changing a pixel here and there is enough to uh, make your classifier think it's suddenly an ostrich. Uh, the inverse thing can also happen. You can have images that are uh, look like noise and have them be classified as a certain object or certain animals with nearly 100% certainty. 
uh, this is not just something that can happen to uh, image recognition. Uh, any classifier can be subject to adversarial attacks. Uh, sound analysis systems, for example, can also be uh, fooled. You can just add a, a, a tiny sound signal to a sound wave and make, um, for example, text-to-speech system uh, output something completely different. So this is really a, 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 a general kind of attack that can happen to uh, any AI system. So regardless of the data format. These attacks are often quite robust. Um, it's uh, if if you look at it, oh, you can't read it on the slide. I'm afraid it's it's a bit small. But um, uh, on the left you see a picture of a cat that gets classified as a bowl of guacamole. Uh, on the right you see the same image with just a pixel change. They rotate it slightly, and there it's correctly classified as uh, a cat. So. Uh, the attack is robust because minute changes are uh, only required to do this. And um, you can try and mitigate this, but you'll always find some way of varying your image, some way of changing your image uh, that, uh, change that uh, uh, fools the system again and again and again. You can't keep uh, trying and fixing these things forever. So uh, stickers on objects are also a famous example of this. You, uh, very uh, important in, for example, image recognition for self-driving cars. If it's enough to uh, put a few stickers on a uh, stop sign to make it be recognized as, uh, as uh, this is a crate of beer, I think it's bottles of beer. Yeah, uh, eight bottles of beer. Um, yeah, of course, you don't want this happening in, in your self-driving uh, Tesla or whatever. This is, a, this is an important problem and it's not uh, solved uh, yet. So what causes it? Well, first of all, if you uh, look at images, uh, the size the, of, the, of the, the possible input data set is virtually infinite. You can have insane amounts of combinations of pixels, and you can't possibly have them all in your data sets. Uh, you suffer from the curse of dimensionality here. Curse of dimensionality, that's, um, that actually wants to say, like, your data set, your training data set cannot possibly be large enough to cover all possible combinations of all the parameters, in this case, all the pixels uh, in, um, in the universe. So you've got, you're, you've got to stop somewhere, your data set is limited, and what happens then? Well, you're going to overfit to your data sets, your, generaliz your generalization potential is limited. And in the end, uh, if your machine learning system is trained, it turns out that adding one strong feature from another class is enough to fool the system. So some other examples here, like uh, putting a sticker uh, of, of a toaster-like object on a table. Suddenly your banana is classified as a toaster. And, and here's a nice example uh, from the KU Leuven uh, very recently, uh, where they actually tried to fool uh, cameras, uh, surveillance cameras. So it turns out that wearing just a t-shirt with a certain print on it is enough to uh, make sure that the uh, person detection software inside the surveillance camera doesn't detect you as a person anymore. You can just walk through the scene undetected, at least undetected by the camera, that is. Um, uh, so uh, this, is, this is an interesting problem. It's not yet solved. It's a very active area of research, and we're sure to see uh, um, a lot more examples popping up in the next few years. Good. Uh, AI systems in the wild, we're all subject to AI systems. We all use recommendation systems. If you open up uh, YouTube, Spotify, um, we all um, go to a bank where uh, the bank is going to analyze all our parameters and put it through some sort of model to compute how uh, likely they are willing to give us a loan and whatsoever. We all. Um, uh, use Google and Google uh, puts ad uh, or Facebook they put advertisements online uh, tailored to our profiles. That's all AI. Now these AI systems uh, can also be uh, used against us, uh, against us as citizens. So. Uh, this is important also in a government context. You, you, if you are going to implement an AI system, of course you want to make sure that citizens can trust the system, that the system is trustworthy in general. 
So the societal aspects of uh, artificial intelligence system, they're important to consider, especially for uh, government applications. But of course, as a company, as a commercial company, you also want your customers to be able to trust you um, uh, maximally. So uh, as a citizen, well, you uh, encounter things that are not so nice. You encounter phishing attempts. And these phishing attempts, for example, they, they get automated. AI systems now uh, try and optimize uh, phishing attempts uh, for credibility, and they try to tailor this towards their audience. And this can take several forms. For example, I, I, I uh, launch a tweet. I, I tweet something about um, a bank, let's say Citibank here. And this AI system can derive um, very simply, OK, I'm a customer at Citibank. If I want to uh, send a phishing mail to this particular person, I probably don't want to use uh, 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 templates from BNP Paribas, Fortis, or uh, KBC, or whatever other bank. Uh, I'll probably want to use Citibank. So this is a very simplified example. But this can get more and more uh, optimized, tailored towards your specific profile uh, as these uh, phishing attempts also get more and more automated. So uh, adversaries are also going to crawl social media. And through social media, the things you've published, they can build up a very detailed profile of a citizen. Or, for example, of a website. If you if you're a company, uh, uh, they, they they can fake a website as well. Fake websites are also how people get uh, fooled into this. So, what do you put online? Uh, you've probably published something if you're on Twitter or on Reddit about your personal interests. Uh, we can derive where you've been, uh, which companies you've interacted with, where. Um, who you've spoken to, what you've published, uh, how you use language is also a very important one. If I want to, for example, impersonate you uh, and in, in general, get a, get a sense of your style. So this is an attempt that I came across two months ago. Uh, this is a phishing attempt. This is an almost exact a uh, copy of a website of a Belgian newspaper, Het Laatste Nieuws. And this was a fully functional website. If I clicked on any of these articles, I would get an actual article um, on, uh, on, uh, uh, to read. But uh, the only thing that makes clear that this is a phishing attempt is actually the URL, which says here associated-press.org. This is a classic Bitcoin scam. If I were to click on that uh, article, on the main article there, I would be diverted to a website that would try to get me subscribed into some uh, Bitcoin pyramid scheme. But this is, uh, this is, this is a phishing attempt that I came across that, that really took me uh, some time to uh, uh, realize, oh wow, this is getting really, really good. Um, this also puts the door open, all these personalization uh, potential for uh, abuse in the sense of impersonations. So we've already seen some cases of CEO fraud where an attacker impersonates an important uh, politician or a CEO of a company and tries to uh, get something done inside that company. Uh, this can be done on a large scale if you automate all this and uh, we'll probably see, because people put so much information online, we'll probably see more of these attacks in the future. Uh, you might be uh, targeted yourself. So here's, here's a LinkedIn user. Everybody uses LinkedIn if, you're, uh, if you build out your career uh, professionally. Uh, these automated bot armies, these crawlers, these scra scrapers, these web scrapers, they can just uh, scrape information from your profile, uh, make a fake profile themselves and put it online and pretend that they're uh, a, a profile that looks like you and try to get some information from your contacts, for example, or try to build up a bot army to, uh, for whatever reason they want to use it. Another uh, issue, uh, societal issue that we get into is the famous issue of uh, fake news. Now, fake news, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult term. And uh, people use it uh, whenever they can to try and win an argument, but not everything is fake news. So before I start discussing fake news uh, and disinformation, I want to agree on a very, very clear definition of what is fake news. And I'm going to inspire myself on what the European Commission has worked out, because they've been dealing with fake news for a while already. Uh, 
Um, so fake news, let's define it as verifiably false information that's disseminate, disseminated for economic gain or to intentionally deceive an audience and that may cause public harm. And what is excluded from the definition of fake news is uh, anything that's like an extreme political opinion, uh, lobbying, advocacy, campaigning, um, uh, satire, parody, and religion, that's not fake news. Those are opinions, that's a valid part of uh, the public discourse, of the public debate. So, uh, fake news, let's only uh, focus on those things that are actually harmful uh, for society. Uh, it does happen. For example, if you've, if you've uh, had, in 2015, I believe, you've had uh, the, the famous downing of uh, MH13, an airplane from Malaysia Airlines, and which was downed presumably by uh, Russian-aided uh, troops in Ukraine. And Russian, Russia really started a, a, a campaign through their uh, state outlets, like Russia Today, uh, to try and convince people, like, look, this wasn't us. So they, they, they really did an effort to create fake news, to try and uh, create doubt in people's minds. And that's actually uh, why the European Commission was uh, on it already fairly early and uh, decided to, took some ac to take some action and to try and, and study this. So in the case of fake news, the danger here is really, can we generate this? Because that's when it becomes dangerous. If we uh, suddenly get like, uh, an avalanche of fake news and Twitter gets flooded with fake news and, and incorrect information, drowning out all other actual conversation, well, this might be a, a risk to the, to, the, to the public discourse, to the, to, the, to, to the politics in general, to the democracy. Well, this information can be generated actually for images. Uh, a lot of progress has been made. If you look at where we were in 2014, where we were in 2018, um, now it's even better if you... There are websites where you can generate fake faces, for example. And we've seen deep fakes pop up. Uh, deep fakes are, uh, they still need some manual effort if you really want to make them very good, but we're getting there. So images, yes, we can generate now uh, reliably and with uh, some sense of credibility, let's say. But text, can we generate text? Uh, can we actually uh, make a fake text, make a fake story, maybe write a book through an AI? Well, uh, text turns out it's not that easy. Uh, so the current state of the art of text generation systems, it's uh, the OpenAI GPT-2 model. So back in February, they hadn't um, uh, uploaded uh, the entire model yet because they found it too dangerous. By now, they have uh, given the entire model. They free for free, uh, so they freed it. Um, this is more or less what comes out. So let's read this. Uh, the prompt is, of course, on the theme of uh, the Lord of the Rings. Uh, let's say, uh, and, and our system generates uh, uh, a text. Jimli was a tall and, tall and powerful man, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he was also a dwarf, blah, blah, blah. He was not a man who looked like a hobbit. So uh, what do we get from this? Well. Uh, grammatically, this is perfect language. Uh, there, there's no grammar errors in here. The grammar is perfectly correct. Uh, the text also sticks well to the theme of the Lord of the Rings. There's not suddenly some Star Wars reference in there. But the internal consistency, you can see that the system doesn't really have a clue what it say. It doesn't know the meaning quite yet. The internal consistency is not there. It says related words, but it can't really put them into the right context just yet. It doesn't have, really have an overarching view of uh, the narrative. And stylistically, it's, um, it's not fantastic. It's, if, if you generate longer texts with these kind of things, it gets very repetitive, very boring. Words get repeated. So uh, we're not there yet. But uh, all in all, it's not bad. And we're now at a point where uh, if you generate enough of those short texts, well, there might be a few of them that are good enough uh, that you can put on Twitter and they might fool inattentive humans. So that's kind of the, where we are right now. This is likely to improve as well, uh, but it depends to be seen. Uh, systems like OpenAI GPT-2, they're already trained on the largest data sets they could possibly collect, like uh, Wikipedia in every language, uh, the, all the debates of all the parliaments in the world, stuff like that, uh, entire libraries. 
you'd need even more data to get it uh, better, maybe, or they might come up with uh, yeah, uh, better uh, language models uh, uh, through changes in the architectures they use. We don't know. What doesn't help here is uh, recommendation systems. Uh, if you uh, send fake news uh, into the world, recommendation systems can amplify that things. You'll see this on YouTube. I'm picking out YouTube because it's the most obvious example. If you start YouTube uh, and you start watching a video on vegetarianism and you put the autoplay on, within four videos you'll be watching videos about veganism. And if you start watching videos about jogging, within four videos you'll, uh, you'll be at a video about ultramarathons. So there's really something in YouTube, in their recommender system, that tries to push you towards um, more radical content in general. So this is a, a, a known effect. Eh? So uh, um, the the thing that happens here is the stuff that is radical is uh, lucrative for YouTube because people uh, watch it for longer. People uh, are uh, excited by stuff that's uh, controversial, by stuff that uh, yeah. Uh, captures their interest and uh, people watch it for longer and these things get uh, higher and higher up in the rankings up until the end where if you're gonna actually look for something uh, yeah, uh, innocuous like say the Federal Reserve the first thing you're gonna see now is uh, are like, like conspiration theories uh, uh, quite a few articles have been published uh, on that already. So uh, uh, people blame YouTube for the rising flat Earth theory. Uh, if you look uh, videos about the moon landing, the first thing you get is also conspiration theories about how it was all faked and whatever. But this is not just a problem with YouTube. Uh, there are many other platforms that have recommender systems behind them. This is a problem for any uh, platform that uh, serves content through a recommender system. So the system at play here is that any content is watched more, uh, of course, obtains a higher ranking in any search results. It gets watched more, it obtains a higher ranking. And this is, uh, this is kind of an infinite loop. The thing is, uh, YouTube and, uh, and other uh, content providers, they want you to uh, watch inflammatory content because that keeps you watching and that gives them advertising dollars. And the objective function behind the YouTube recommendation system is not to give you what you are looking for, to give you objective information. It's to optimize the income from advertisement dollars. That's a completely different objective. So here we, we, we also have this uh, dichotomy between uh, what the user is actually wanting from the service, objective information, and what actually YouTube can offer it. Uh, so yeah, that's the moon landing, global warming, same thing, uh, fake hoaxes. So uh, quite a lot of articles were published about this in the beginning of this year. They've promised that they would do better. Uh, I'm not sure if they have already. At least for some topics, they've already uh, like manually put some corrections in. If you're going to look for the moon landing now, you'll see an actual NASA video, for example. But yeah, this is, this is not like a structural solution. We'll, we'll see uh, whether they come up with anything better than this. Uh, good. Uh, I've got eight minutes. I'll see what I can still uh, say about uh, more the policy-related topics that come into play. First of all, most of the people in the audience are engineers or computer scientists. Uh, there are conferences about bias, fairness, accountability, transparency, ethics, where all these kind of topics are discussed. If this interests you, I, I, wouldn't, I, would, I would recommend you to uh, have a look at uh, the papers that get published at these kind of conferences. At least as a, as a technical person, the excuse of uh, wir haben das nicht gewusst, uh, that doesn't work anymore. And nowadays, uh, we as, as uh, technical people, uh, I am a computer scientist, um, we are held responsible for the systems that we build. Uh, and uh, we, we, are, we, we can't just uh, put the responsibility for anything that goes wrong with, oh, this was uh, some, uh, some decision that management took, I have nothing to do with this. We also have an obligation to inform management correctly and to uh, build systems uh, that are um, fair and unbiased and to, uh, transparent and ethical. 
So uh, the the um, the general sense that's uh, that, that that's really growing is that we as engineers also have to take responsibility for this and have to be more attentive to these uh, topics. So accountability, I'm, I'm going to single it out. Uh, explainable AI, explainable artificial intelligence systems is, are something that uh, draws some attention. Why? Because, well, if an AI is going to make um, a decision by its own, uh, you want to know why it makes that decision. For some kinds of AI systems, like uh, if, if it's just like a decision tree, that's easy to do. You look at what uh, path your uh, decision uh, took through the decision tree. But for deep learning, it becomes way more difficult because you've got models of millions of parameters, hundreds of millions of parameters sometimes. And um, yeah, how are you going to explain this? You, you, you can't give uh, someone a printout of the values of 100 million parameters. That's not doable. That doesn't say a thing. That doesn't make it any clearer. Um, this is also an active area of research. How can we explain uh, the reasoning that um, uh, deep learning, uh, deep neural networks uh, take? It's not solved yet, but some uh, inroads are being made. Uh, for example, in uh, visualizing the features that it computes, visualizing the separate layers. Um, also, to be continued in the next few years and definitely going to be uh, a, a topic that will uh, get some more media attention as well. Certainly when the time comes that these AI systems that actually make decisions by themselves are uh, put into the wild. So yeah, uh, what can you do to protect yourself against scams? You're all smart people, actually, I'm going to skip this. You've seen that uh, uh, these things pop up. Uh, you, you can recognize uh, these uh, fake uh, profiles. Um, what's necessary here is basically awareness. You are being profiled. What The stuff that you put online, the data that you put online, can be scraped and can be used by adversaries against you. Um, if you're working with recommendation systems, if you're logged into your Google account or into your YouTube account, you're not seeing what your neighbor is seeing. Uh, so you should be aware of that as well. And anything you post can be used against you. Good. Uh, you want to rely on authoritative, transparent sources for your information. Uh, and here is probably um, uh, room for some more interest in actual good peer-reviewed science and uh, actual good investigative journalism. We don't have enough investigative journalism, good investigative journal journalism to uh, uncover everything that goes wrong. If you look at uh, the, um, the, the mechanisms that are used in, in uh, the, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, the, the resources that it took to, to uncover these kind of things, uh, we need more of that because for every Cambridge Analytica, I'm, there, I'm sure there's plenty of other firms that are also scraping our data and doing very, fairly similar things. So we really need a new effort in good quality journalism that can uh, try and uncover uh, the, those abuses because they're covered up, they, they're really hard to detect sometimes. So what I want to do is uh, encourage digital skepticism somehow. If you go online, uh, try and um, keep your feet on the ground. You don't need to be paranoid. Nobody needs to be paranoid and, and, and shut everything off. But uh, don't believe the first conspiracy theory that you see. I mean, this is kind of obvious, uh, of course. But this requires some competences and literacy. And uh, the general public, well, my grandma doesn't have the competences or the literacy to uh, be able to uh, deal with this by herself. She needs, she needs help. She, she, she needs that quality journalism to be able to um, steer this. So uh, this is something that we need to stress also now that at least in Belgium new governments are being formed. Uh, literacy and digital literacy is more and more important. Now uh, we're not completely uh, in the wild with all this. Eh? We're, we're not being hunted. Uh, there are some protections. There are some legal protections as well. And by far the major important uh, law in that respect is uh, the GDPR. So the GDPR is uh, is uh, is a uh, is very interesting to read. If you ha if okay, I'm not into law. Uh, nobody likes law texts, but uh, I do recommend that you read it at least once full. There is this article in the GDPR that says explicitly that data subjects, being us citizens, have a right 
to not be the subject to a decision based solely on automated processing. This means there always needs to be a human that has the end responsibility. There needs to be a human in the loop. However, uh, the, lobbying, the lobbyists in Brussels have done their job as well. Uh, there is an exception uh, if the data subjects has uh, if the citizen has pressed on I agree on uh, some terms and conditions, uh, this doesn't count anymore. Uh, it's important to know about this. Uh, we, are, we are seeing now the first fines being handed out. There was one case in Sweden where a school got fined for trying to do uh, image recognition on uh, the, the pupils of the school to try and see who is attending classes and who isn't. So the, the privacy authority of Sweden fined the school uh, 20,000 kroner or something uh, because uh, Miners could not give uh, explicit consent, and there was a power relationship between the two. We'll see these kind of cases uh, being fought out in law, in, in courts, and uh, this is going to be very interesting as well to follow up on. So yeah, for policymakers, if you, if you are in management, if you are a politician, uh, you're also uh, vulnerable to uh, pre-selected information. Uh, if you're a CEO of a company, um, uh, you might be uh, the victim of information warfare. You, things like these exist. Uh, so what do you want to do? Also, uh, as a policymaker, as a politician, stimulate uh, quality media, innovation and research, and really like try and establish a culture of permanent learning. Uh, important in that respect is all those strategy plans you come up with, you also need to put the necessary money behind it. Good, the EU is doing uh, lots of stuff. Uh, I'm gonna skip this because I'm out of time. Uh, there's lots of interesting documents, uh, long reports to read if you uh, wanna read up on policy issues. Um, but uh, you'll get the slides afterwards, I'm sure. Uh, you can uh, peruse this at your own uh, pace. So I wanna end with, yeah, uh, things you've already known. Eh? I'm gonna highlight the last thing. If you're talking to management, expectation management is very important. Uh, you really want to make sure that they don't have uh, any, um, that, that management doesn't have any uh, unrealistic expectations. Uh, and expectation management should be the, the first thing you try and do when you define a project for AI, because everybody wants to do AI nowadays. Good. Thank you. Uh, if you have questions, if you want to talk more about this, find me at the Smalls booth. So we're sponsoring DevOps. Uh, we're somewhere there on the um, main floor. And also, of course, we're a large company, but we need like 100 more uh, Java developers or something. We're hiring. Uh, come talk to us if uh, uh, the social security or uh, e-health or uh, something like that interests you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.